All right, you're listening to IWC News. I'm your host, Joseph Miller, and I'd like to introduce my co-host, Noah Montag, to begin with our top story. Well, thank you, Joseph, for introducing me. I really appreciate that warm welcome for you this week, especially we took a week off. It was a little bit tough, but hopefully we're able to make it until this week. Um, hopefully we'll give you an exciting overview of exactly uh, what's important in the news, because I'm sure you've seen a lot of the junk that's going around online. Um, anyways, um, just in terms of the big, the biggest news for this week by far is that there was a big um, acceleration of the stimulus negotiations. Um, there was a bipartisan group of senators and House uh, representatives, about 50 members of the House of Representatives, which is a pretty significant um, amount of people, that endorsed a $908 billion compromise proposal. Um, and the details of the proposal, um, obviously, you'll be able to look up online, but just to give a general overview, is that um, there would be no stimulus checks, um, which happened in the first, in the CARES Act, when they sent out $1,200 to, to everyone that was making over a certain amount, uh, under a certain amount. And then there was, uh, and the stimulus bill will include enhanced unemployment. Um, it will include a eviction moratorium. And it will also include temporary liability. And what the goal of the representatives that were endorsed the bill, they said that basically they want to give the states the opportunity to pass the bill. So they're just going to give a temporary um, abatement of lawsuits against um, any liability in terms of COVID. Like, for example, if a worker goes to his office, whatever, and he gets COVID, then he, he currently he could sue the office for uh, malpractice, whatever it is. However, with this... Um, Lawsuit, uh, lawsuit liability of um, pause, it would not be able to take place and give the states the opportunity to pass uh, regulations um, and laws to um, stop those. Um, the Republicans specifically are ner are very worried that um, that people will start going back to work and there'll be a loss, there'll be a tremendous amount of lawsuits over the next few years and drive a tremendous amount of companies under. Um, that's the Republican side. And the Democrats seem to be seem to be willing um, in general to pass liability protection. However, they're worried about uh, favoritism being shown to corporations and the like. Um, so we'll see if that um, uh, that bill is passed. However, um, there is a big, um, just in terms of general, um, every single year, the government has to fund itself. Um, they pass a bill, they fund themselves. However, because of the uh, because it's become so politically difficult over the past few years, what the government does is they just combine all the funding bills of each department. So the State Department has one, the Defense Department has one. They combine them into a bill called an omnibus bill, and which allows it to just pass everything at once. And like basically, senators have no choice but to vote for it, or they're going to shut down the government. Um, it's it's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people don't like how they do it, and it's very controversial. However, that's basically, it goes up um, right before the deadline and it passes. And what Speaker Pelosi and Leader McConnell agreed, um, it seems to agree that they will add the COVID-19 relief bill onto those omnibus, onto the omnibus passing, which would help enable it to be passed before the end of the year. Um, obviously, I don't want to give a probability. It's hard to know when the bill will be passed, but I do expect that a COVID relief bill will be passed this upcoming year. And I do not expect a government um, shutdown. However, you know, everything, you know, it's Congress, you never know what could happen. So now, um, so yeah, we give, I just wanted to give you a high level view of exactly where the stimulus negotiations are. And I do think that uh, just to add is that it could be a buying opportunity in terms of uh, stocks. If there's a stimulus uh, proposal passed, it could be a good buying opportunity because um, it will induce a tremendous amount of stimulus into the economy. Um, and people, and the, you could say that the market's already priced in a recovery bill, but I do think it will jump, help jumpstart the economy um, in general. Um, in terms of another big- I just like to comment on that. It's very unclear how a stimulus will continue to, uh, bills will continue to affect the economy. I mean, there are several important factors, at least in terms of the stock market, that need to be taken to, into consideration. I mean, num number one, which I'll we'll touch a little bit on later, is inflation. We're printing money like never before. Uh, with more and more stimulus bills, it's, it's, it's very possible there might be, um, you know, a lot of inflation. At the same time, even with the increase 
of spending and, and the increase in the um, in the stock market, you have to look at which companies are actually leading the um, le- leading the, the the bull market since the lows of March, and those are usually the and, and mostly the big tech firms. Meaning, if you look year year to year on a, for example, take the S and P, um, you know, equal weight versus the standard S and P 500, which is weighted by which, which is weighted by market cap. You'll note that the equal weight companies only grew about uh, somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 percent year over year, meaning the top 10 companies actually took over a, a lot of the profits. Now, if you think about it, some of those companies make a lot of sense in terms of the corona shutdowns. So, for example, Amazon, people are, or even Walmart, if you, companies which have a big presence online, which deal with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, dry goods and, and even groceries. So those obviously had a very big increase in spending. So too with the tech companies, Google, Facebook, with people on with people at home, they're going to be using a lot more, or, or people working remotely. They're even though Zoom is you know the you know you know the big buzz company now, people are using a lot more services from these companies. Even Microsoft as well. Um, but if you think of the bottom uh, percentage of the companies, you have to think. So how much room is there left? For uh, for these companies to grow and recover, meaning um, meaning based off of where we were uh, 12 months ago, how far are we from those companies recovering, and how far are we for from those companies growing, as opposed to the top tech companies, which might even drop, being that things are going to be things can potentially be less and less remote, meaning the companies that uh, whose market cap shot up and whose uh, whose profits shot up. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to continue going forward because if you, if you just think about it, it's true. We might be more reliant on them than in the past, but at very least, we will, we're going to be start, you know, going to the groceries change more, change more often. We're going to start eating out more often. I mean, a lot of the money that we spend were on entertainment. We might be spending on entertainment. You know, movie theaters might open up and instead of streaming services, people might head to the movie theaters. You know, it's hard to know exactly where money is going to be spent since number one, a lot of the companies have not recovered, but number two, a lot of the companies that have not recovered or only partially covered or only partially gained might begin to eat away from the profits, from the growth of a lot of these other larger companies. So not to say that to expect that these larger companies won't grow over, over time, but to, say, but to say that there might be some sort of a cannibalism in terms of growth, where the money being spent on these large companies might actually end up just being uh, moving towards the smaller companies. So to summarize, basically, Joseph, in, in, basic, in a very few words, we don't know exactly which companies are going to be going up next year because of the, the truth is, is that there was a tremendous amount of stocks that went up, a tremendous amount, even much more than their value is worth. However, on the flip side, there are a lot of companies that have missed baskets, like some some of them um, did very well, like some bad, like streaming, for example, might have done very well, but advertising revenue could have shot down like crazy. So there are mis- mixed baskets on a lot of companies, and therefore it doesn't matter what happens if COVID starts receding, those kinds of companies could go up a tremendous amount more. My point was just that, uh, that, that a lot of the growth that one might see from a stimulus bill might actually not. Uh, n- not continue to have an increase in the market. It might actually just be a restructure on how we spend money. Meaning even if certain uh, people are saving money and cutting costs using certain services, um, people, when we go back to normal uh, or as uh, people start going back to normal, uh, as, as more things go- start opening up, as there are less and less lockdowns, you'll find that people might actually be using that money towards different avenues and actually taking away money from previous avenues. So there might be more of a restructuring. That's correct, but we don't know necessarily. I mean, if you take a company like Microsoft, um, their business models done tremendously because of the virtual environment and us needing to use the Microsoft suite a tremendous amount more than ever before. However, um, we don't know what a post COVID work environment is going to be. I would expect that there's going to be a lot more virtual uh, sessions, which could help, um, companies like Microsoft and the like 
um, gain more and more market share. Um, so let's put that aside. We're going to come back to this topic because there's really just a tremendous amount to discuss on that over the next few weeks, months, years, and the like. Um, in terms of something else that's also probably on the minds of a lot of our listeners is what's going on with the vaccine rollout. And um, so we don't exactly know what day the vaccine is going to be approved by the FDA. Um, something to note, which is uh, people are probably really curious, like why was the vaccine already approved in Britain and why are they starting to get it out before us? And the truth is, is that it seems like the FDA just does a much longer review process. And um, December 11th, uh, December 9th through 11th, the FDA has an independent board that's looking at the data and they'll recommend whether or not to approve the Pfizer vaccine. If that's approved, then the Operation Word Speed, the leader of that, um, is promising that the day after we are going to start shipping vaccines. And it could be that within the next few week or two weeks, a person's people start actually getting the vaccines. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not acting like one, but from what I understand is that you're not impervious, you're never impervious to getting COVID even after the vaccine. However, you, you will get some protection after the first vaccine and you'll get a lot more in this after the second vaccine. And something to note um, also is that the Moderna vaccine is poised to be approved probably right before Christmas. So there's going to be a week or two where the, the Pfizer vaccine will be the only one on the market. And then the Moderna vaccine will, uh, will start being offered. And that could um, enable about approximately 20 million Americans to get the vaccine, the first shot of the vaccine before January 1 which would be actually really cool um, just because is that obviously we know how COVID's impacting the world a tremendous amount. And this could help um, start the process of lowering the risks of COVID outbreaks. Um, and in terms of something else very important to mention is that there are a lot of other vaccine uh, rollouts happening. And Joseph's gonna speak about more um, in depth about one of the vaccine trials that went Ori, but um, in terms of the Johnson and Johnson one, the Wall Street Journal had an article explaining how a lot the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is one where you get one shot, and that's why people are very excited about it because in terms of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, you have to go back and get another shot. Um, but the point of that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is a lot of people in the placebo group um, of the trial, meaning they did not get the actual vaccine; they're just being tested against the people that did get the vaccine they could drop out and go get the Pfizer Moderna ones, which will impact how the Johnson Johnson COVID vaccine trial goes and could slow it down a tremendous amount. Um, in a regular vaccine trial, you don't know whether or not you got the vaccine. However, because you could just go get antibody tested, you go get antibody tested, you don't have antibodies. They're like, oh, we got the placebo. Let's go, let's move out. We're gonna go get the Pfizer or uh, Moderna vaccine. And which could impact those trials, which could really slow down the COVID um, 19 vaccine response. Uh, but Joseph's going to speak about one specific vaccine. Well, before we actually get that, to that vaccine, there's another point just, uh, I think that's worth mentioning in terms of the, the uh, Moderna, the Moderna vaccine. You know, again, I'm just like Noam, I'm not a doctor. Um, and not, Wait, not Joseph, yet. you're not a doctor? Not yet, at least, but I've been working on getting an honorary PhD. So we'll, hopefully in the near future, I could be announced that I will be a doctor, but let's see. Um, not not one not an MD, uh, but uh, and another important point on the Moderna vaccine is that it's actually while it's around ninety four percent effective in terms of per, um, it it's also it's also about a hundred percent it's it's hundred percent effective from preventing deadly uh, coronavirus meaning from killing people meaning there's a huge distinction uh, one of the big fears a lot of people had with the COVID vaccine is vac as most vaccines essentially deliver weaker dosages or some type of uh, thing that's going to trigger you to get the, um, the, to get the disease so that you can build some type of immunity towards it. Uh, while there are, different, there are different types of vaccines that do different things, um, in terms of Moderna, what they found is that, uh, that people are not, uh, are, not, are not dying from it. They're getting uh, less, they're, they're not getting deathly ill, and there's and, and that's very big for the uh, for the elder community because one of the big worries uh, that that a lot of the elder people were were that they were not going to get the vaccine is because well 
if they're afraid they're going to catch, if there's like a some percent chance that they're going to get uh, COVID from these shots, you know, they, it might, they might be very afraid of taking it because essentially it's the option of getting COVID now versus later. But having such a successful rate in terms of preventing deadly disease is humongous for the at-risk community. I, they didn't really release those numbers in terms of all the other the other um, va vaccines. Presumably it's high, but 100% or near 100% as they reported is very significant. AstraZeneca in conjunction with Oxford that they began trials for their own COVID vaccine where they actually had a hiccup where a certain percentage of the sample they were tested was given, the, the way the, they originally were planning were giving two full doses. But instead, in a certain percentage of the sample were given one, one dose and then a half dose instead of, instead of two full doses. And they actually found that that one and a half dose was actually more successful than the two doses. But the one and a half was somewhere around 90% effective, whereas the two doses were 60 uh, percent plus effective, which is a pretty big hiccup, uh, especially being the the uh, how serious COVID is, how serious it is not just uh, from a health perspective, but from a financial perspective, it pretty much shut down the entire world. Uh, so it's, it's it's a pretty big hiccup to, to to make a mistake in terms of it. But uh, it'll be interesting to find out if maybe. Uh, maybe in this smaller sample, maybe there is some sort of uh, more effective way to distribute the dosage. Maybe it'll be better also in terms of conserving resources, where obviously, you know, less is better than more if we don't have to do more. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, Joseph, I just want to add, it's pretty crazy what's, what happened there. Um, like this is one of the most high profile, if not the most high profile thing that the company's ever done. And they Someone messed it up. Who knows who did it? Uh, just want to add that point. Thanks for the addition. Um, next, well, I'd talk about a little more uh, local news, at least for us, which is uh, New York City. Um, we've been speaking about, you know, a couple times already, but the flight from New York. Um, we've mentioned in a previous podcast that, um, that if you look at uh, some statistics in terms of electoral college predictions, for in four years from now, which are relevant in terms of state population, you'll find that New York specifically is is geared to lose two or three electoral uh, uh, points in the electoral college, meaning they're going to lose a lot of citizens. Specifically, New York City, of of all places, are really losing and they lose house seats. They lose, lose house seats and they lose. Well. But specifically in terms of of New York City, are where a lot of people are really fleeing from. So I, I recently Bloomberg uh, um, announced, or, 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 or um, excuse me, Goldman Sachs announced uh, via Bloomberg that there's going to be, they're going to be opening a new massive office in Florida. That is a huge blow to Wall Street. Now Wall Street has historically been, you know, the center of finance, um, investment banking, you know, stock market related things. Um, throughout, you know, historically speaking. And the reason originally was because it's closer to the exchange. And at that time, um, the amount of time you could uh, process data was based off of how close your wires were to the computers or the systems which were actually tracking prices. So if you had, you know, half a, per, you know, half a percent uh, faster than the guy next to you, just because you were, you know, your wire was a few inches shorter, just because um, your your wire was a little uh, can process uh, information a little bit faster, so um, you know you actually had an advantage because you could just um, sell off. You'll you'll know you know a second faster uh, what prices are going to be and try to do some sort of arbitrage. Now in the uh, it, now in the more where, where things have turned pretty much computerized at this point, and in terms of it being, you know, public access, there's really, you could really be almost anywhere in the world and have the same type of, uh, you know, quick data um, as somewhere else. So the question is, wh what is the future of Wall Street? Is Wall Street going to just historically, because that's where they built offices, that's, that's where they're going to continue to build, build offices? Well, because of a lot of the politics that are going on in, in New York, a lot of the problems that are going on in New York, uh, Goldman Sachs announced that they're going to be building offices uh, in Florida, which has followed other companies like JP Morgan, and we'll find that many other businesses and people are actually leaving 
New York City. I and also, I want to add that I believe in Florida, the cost of living is lower than New York, which allows Goldman Sachs to pay their workers less in Florida, in theory, at least. And New York is one of the most expensive cities. I think it was it's a top five most expensive city um, in terms of in terms of rent, as well as Bloomberg also reported even before COVID, um, they, New York was on track to lose about uh, about a little less than uh, a little more than 2,500 people um, a week, which is a very significant amount of the population. Post COVID, they were losing even more. So it'll be very interesting to see the demographic change in New York City. Very, it'll be very interesting to see how businesses are in New York City. You know, especially with lockdowns. You know, Broadway, a lot of the more touristy areas have closed down. Are they going to come back? And what capacity are they going to come back? Um, especially, there's a you know there, there's a growing to what degree? Problem. Yeah, there's also a growing homeless problem. You know, there's a, a large jump in crime uh, in New York City. So. Uh, and people time, are scared to take public transit, which yeah. will affect um, New York City being able to return in all metro areas, really, because if people are scared to go, not only because of homeless, just because of san sanitary prospects um, that could really affect things as well. Yeah, so there are... There are because there are, as, as we all know, it's pretty hard to drive around Times Square. Yeah, so there are, there are right now a plethora of reasons that are, that are causing people to fly, to, 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 to flee from New York, you know. A drink from uh, Governor Cuomo isn't enough to keep people in New York City, so it'll be uh, it'll be pretty interesting to see what kind of businesses are going to f thrive in New York City. You know, even Wall Street itself uh, is 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 beginning to to you know to move out of New York City. So we'll have to see what the demographic is in terms of people, in terms of businesses. Um, that'll be. But very I do think though, what could be interesting, um, I'm not sure if this would happen, but could it possibly a boon to the hospitality industry long term? is that people move out of New York but have to come in for business meetings and the like, and they just, instead of getting apartments, they stay in hotels. It could possibly be a boon for them. It could. It, it could also possibly be that these offices are going to close down. Why would, why would someone stay in New York if people are fleeing? I mean, the, re the, be the reason to be in New York, or at least for specifically for Wall Street, was to be closer to the exchange. There's no reason to build in it to, to, to rent such exorbitant pricing um, close to the exchange when you can move to you know Florida and not have to pay those prices. So it's true. It could there could be some sort of thing where you know people are flying into New York, but again, uh, I I think it's I think it's going to be worse than zero growth. I mean, it's not that they're going to be the same amount of jobs and just the new jobs are all going to have to fly in to visit. I think. It's going to be more and more people fleeing because at this point, there's no reason in terms of proximity to be anywhere. You don't have to be in a big city sense, center to do anything anymore. You could be wherever you want in the internet age. So when, a, when something comes, becomes expensive and inconvenient, um, that, then, it's, that, then it's no surprise that there's going to be a massive flight. So we're not exactly sure um, on all of President Biden's nominees. However, it would seem to be that the Republicans are inclined to approve most, if not all of them. Um, some, some diehard conservatives will probably be upset because President Trump um, was given a hard time by Democrats, especially in the beginning of uh, inauguration, day, uh, inauguration Day. Only two of his nominees were confirmed on day one, um, which was a uh, not historical precedent. Um, so it's, but however, um, I believe it seems that Republicans are pretty receptive toward the nominees of President Biden in general, and especially with the filibuster rule being um, eliminated for executive appointments, which include cabinet picks, uh, they only need 51 to get it over the threshold. Um, so it would seem to be that they'll be able to get most of the votes off of their picks. It's pretty interesting to note. There's a lot of talk about um, if if Democrats have control over the Senate, they're going to they're going to eliminate the filibuster. But a, a lot of areas, the filibuster is already eliminated, including you know major areas like Supreme Court justices, like um, like like nominations. Um, so it'll be very interesting, um, or, or at least it's very interesting that on a certain hand, uh, Democrats led the you know the 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 the, uh, the defeat of the filibusters republicans when it became convenient to the republicans in terms of supreme court nominations obviously extended the power so and then something else uh that's there some of the we were speaking about before 
But just to give a quick analysis is what was interesting is that one of the things that happened this past week is the Federal Reserve chair announced that he does not anticipate within the next two, three years that the Federal Reserve will proactively raise interest rates to curb inflation, which is a big boon for people who want to invest in equity securities, including the stock market, because it gives um, people, uh, if interest rates are low, people tend to invest more in the stock market and out of bonds. And that what, that's one of the things we saw this week is people are more allocating more of their resources and money to equities instead of bonds, which could help propel the market even further. It, that's a big question though, in terms of debt, where, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people are buying government debt. Now. A lot of companies are using government debt instead of company debt. So um, I, I was hearing from someone actually in the, uh, I don't want to call him a loan shark, but essentially he's one of these, uh, he, he runs one of these firms that specifically um, target low income, um, a, a low-income individuals who need uh, who need money for uh, who, who need some type of loans who aren't approved for standard loans, and he told me even there interest rates are dropping, you know, to to record lows in terms of um, of what they're giving even in during even during corona, uh, corona even uh, uh, um, yes even in the corona world. So it's interesting to see you know the uh, how debt is going to play out. Um, especially on the equity market, meaning how is it going to be, are, how are companies going to be buying and selling debt? How can individuals buy and sell debt? And what can someone, what type of returns can we expect on debt with their already uh, very low margins? And we can also expect the housing prices will stay up um, even further than they were during COVID um, because of interest rates, they can get mortgages for lower amounts. Um, in terms of another uh, big um, event is that people are very excited about, um, based on the frenzy of a few years ago, is that Bitcoin reached an all-time high. Um, I know some people personally that made millions of dollars from Bitcoin because they bought it before the hype. And I'm sure that a tremendous amount of people were thrilled with the new highs of Bitcoin. What do you think, Joseph? I think Bitcoin is very interesting. Now, originally I was particularly, uh, I, I thought it was a little bit ridiculous. You know, I used to play these games online where, you know, uh, I would earn points and I would be able to buy things online with points. And it was hard for me to understand the difference between that and Bitcoin. I mean, how come my points from my uh, video game, how come those are less than the points? Those are less than the points, uh, you know, from Bitcoin itself. Now, in truth, there is one thing uh, about Bitcoin that makes it different. And that is the entire function of how Bitcoin transactions work are Bitcoin exists where uh, to, tra to earn Bitcoin, someone has to prove that a sale was, um, that, that sales were real. Meaning essentially you have teams and scores of people who are trying to mine Bitcoin. And the way to mine Bitcoin is to approve transactions, to say that when this person, when person A gave a certain amount of Bitcoin or Bitcoin to person B, that that was a real transaction. So that, that's, so that's the, that's what kind of sets aside Bitcoin as opposed to any other form of currency. Now, is it impossible to, um, is it impossible to, 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 to create something similar? So no, there are actually now hundreds of cryptocurrencies and there are even light versions of, Bito, uh, of Bitcoin currencies where Bitcoin itself the, um, or, or the founders of Bitcoin, um, whoever they may be, um, at least allegedly, being that we can't prove who the founders are, and we can't prove that who, who the, so they, so some of the other currencies are, whether it was them or not, but supposedly they created other currencies that are uh, supposedly are valued less than Bitcoin. Now, what gives the problem with Bitcoin though is even though it's the mo it's a very secure and uh, currency and it's not tied to um, any individual to inflate it, there's still the issue of there's still the issue of what gives it its value. Meaning, just because it's safe and secure doesn't mean anyone should necessarily care. So, um, meaning if, 
if I created, you know, a very efficient, very safe, you know, piece of paper and I, and, and it was impossible for anybody to reproduce because it was so advanced, whatever I, I, I covered it with chemicals and as kind of they did with the, the United States did with a hundred dollar bill, where they've recently added a lot of things to the hundred dollar bill to make it very difficult to, um, to, 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 to create fake ones. To, so the, so it's great and all, but if I do that, nobody's going to, you know, and I say it's worth $100, nobody's going to care. So it's a big question, what gives Bitcoin its value? Will there be another company that can overtake Bitcoin? Will there be a government that eventually adopts some sort of cryptocurrency, which might even work similar to Bitcoin? So I think there are a lot of risks towards Bitcoin. A lot of people are very happy about it, but I, it's, it's, but I think it's hard to prove its value in the same way you can with a bond or a stock. So while I'm happy for all the people who made millions, you know, I, I still remained weary. Well, thank you, Joe, for that pessimistic view. I'm going to invest all my money in Bitcoin because of that, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's usually how it goes. Usually when I tell people not to invest in the stock, like for two years now, I've been telling people don't invest in Tesla, and they didn't listen to me, and they did very well for themselves. So <laughs> I mean, well, I'm not a financial advisor, um, that doesn't mean uh, that I, I'm not telling Maybe you. Maybe a financial not advisor. So if you say I, don't buy something, then definitely buy it. I'm also not here.